For generations, Easter has been a beacon of hope, a testament to enduring faith and renewal. It can be easy to get caught up in how Easter is celebrated now and forget that generations upon generations have gone before us, experiencing the power and the hope of the good news that Jesus ushered in. That first Easter morning, the women who went to the tomb didn't even know what they were about to witness or what they would encounter, but they came face to face with their risen friend, a friend who would become their savior. And after that miraculous moment, year after year, followers of Jesus would gather and celebrate the fact and knowledge that he truly did conquer death and sin and ultimately all that separates us from God. And century after century, follower after follower has passed on this tradition of marking a moment that Jesus did the impossible. So today, let us remember that we are not alone in our celebration. We stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, carrying forward a tradition of celebration that has weathered the tests of time. Followers of Jesus haven't always gotten everything right, but his message transcends beyond that. The good news of Jesus prevails in spite of humanity. And I think that if we just listen closely, we can hear the echoes of Easter woven throughout time, that it is Christ and Christ alone that we stand on. It's the hope, the hope of Easter. We have a tomorrow, and though this body be destroyed, yet we will see God. Let's affirm that hope by singing together. I'd like you to all stand and sing it as your testimony on Easter morning.
happy Easter. You guys can actually stay standing. I know you're about to sit uh, because we are going to keep singing, uh, but we are just so want to say happy Easter. We're so grateful that you all are here and joining us. Hey, if you are standing in the back and you would like a seat, we do have our West Auditorium. There are people down there for our overflow. Uh, if you are joining us online, welcome. We're happy Easter to you as well. Um, and if you are new, if this is your first time at Heartland, we want to say a special hello to you. Uh, in fact, we have a gift for you. So on your way out, you can head to the connection point. Uh, we'd love to meet you and get to know your name and answer any questions that you might have about this place. Uh, but we're just so grateful that we get to celebrate Easter here together. Speaking of which, if you are new, uh, this next part of the service, we say this every single week, but our team's gonna come receive our offering. And uh, if you are new or just visiting, please feel zero pressure, obligation to put any money in the basket. That is not what this is about. Uh, those of us who call Heartland home in Jesus, Lord, it's just an opportunity for us to continue worshiping uh, by being obedient to him. So again, if you're just visiting, check it out. We, we want this morning to be a gift to you and a double gift, because we will give you a gift if you stop by that, which is a BMW, I've heard. It's definitely it's a BM, not a BMW. It's not a BMW. <laughs> it's a mug. Like, don't get that excited. It's, it's, a, it's mug a mug. It's a mug. That you can put in your brand new BMW. You can't put it in there because it's too big to it's put too in a big. cup holder. You can put it on the counter. Why are they making mugs so big? I know. It's a, it's a counter mug, not ones? a car mug. Okay. Uh, anyway. It's a free mug. Yes, that's free right. Mug. Well, we are going to continue worshiping together. We do this every Sunday. This is our, a beautiful reminder to be able to sing words of truth, to be able to kind of black out the chaos and whatever is happening in our lives, whatever. Uh, maybe things that we brought in here to remind ourselves of who God is, that he is powerful, that he is good, and that's what we get to celebrate on Easter morning. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to Heartland.
again, welcome. We are so glad that you're here, that you decided to come um, and celebrate Easter with us. I love when we gather to sing like this because there is so much meaning behind the words that we sing this morning, and we really believe that, um, and we hope that you find a little bit of hope in that um, this morning as well. In just a moment, um, you're gonna have the opportunity to say hello to those around you. Don't make it weird, everybody, okay? Just a quick little hello, and then you can have a seat. Um, again, welcome. We are so glad that you're here this morning. All right, happy Easter, everybody. You made it. This is it. Here it is. Come on. I want to say hello to everybody who's standing in the back of the room, all of you who are seated out in the lobby, and everybody over in Overflow. I understand they're adding chairs to the Overflow because the Overflow room is overflowing. So thank you for your grace and your kindness. And I don't know, maybe next year get here a little earlier and uh, you're sitting here with us. But uh, hey, I want to get started this morning as we remember and celebrate the good news of Jesus together by sharing one of my favorite social media accounts that I follow. I think that a lot of us are on social media these days, and so uh, if you're on Instagram, you got to make sure you sign up to follow this account that I love. It's simply titled the Good News Movement account, and as you can see in their bio, it says, no politics, just current good news. Over 5.5 million people are following following this account because they've discovered, like me, how nice and refreshing it is to just see some good news in your social media feed. And so today, since today's such a big day, I thought I would just share some good news with you that I saw uh, here lately. So this first one is cool. These two guys are best friends. Ben, the man on the right, writes about how he's a worker at a stadium, and every single home game, his best friend buys a ticket and stands in the stands with a name, with his name on a sign, just cheering for him, doesn't even care about the game. He just comes to cheer on his best friend. How cool is that? Isn't that great? I love it. This next one is a boy named Jonah. Jonah taught himself how to crochet at five years old. He is a child prodigy when it comes to crocheting. His crocheting is so prolific and he's so fast, he's been able to sell enough crochet that he's been able to pay for the rebuilding of his school, a local uh, library, and the orphanage in Ethiopia where he was brought up until he was adopted by his forever home. How cool is that, right? Man, that's kids with his forever family now. Uh, this one is a card that somebody left in their, or found in their mailbox. It said, dear neighbor, my name is Emma, and I live across the street at 1659. Would it be okay if I shot some hoops on your basketball hoop after school? Check yes or no. The neighbor said, yes, absolutely have fun. I'm like, come on. And then this one is a uh, little boy was going to school. He got on the bus, ended up in tears because it was pajama day at school, and he didn't have like actual pajamas to wear. So the bus driver felt uh, compassion for him, made a stop, ran into the store, bought him pajamas. He got changed and had a fantastic day at pajama day at school, which is the picture in the top left corner. How cool is that? And then this last one is a, a, a sticker somebody put on a light pole in the city. It said, there was some racist rubbish here, but I covered it up with this picture of a cat. And I just slapping cats on all the racist rubbish on light poles around town. Well, the reason that I take time to share, share those with you is because whenever I think about good news, the very first th thing that comes to mind for me is Jesus. And Easter is at the very center of why, when I think of good news, I think of, of Jesus. For the last few weeks, our church has been in a teaching series called When Jesus Shows Up, simply talking about and looking at and celebrating what happens whenever Jesus shows up. The reality is that when Jesus showed up literally, as in in the flesh, being born for the first time 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born into a, a wild and chaotic world. Many of you probably know that Jesus was born into the, the nation of Israel as a Jewish man in the first century. 
And uh, the, the first century Jewish world was crazy because they were being ruled by the Romans. The Roman Empire had taken over this part of the, the, the world. And so the Roman government had placed heavy taxes and rules and laws on the Israelites that violated their Jewish faith. And so because of this, in response, Jews had sort of splintered. They had divided up into various groups in different ways that they felt they should be responding to the foreign oppression. And so you had groups like the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, you had the Zealots and the Essenes, and then you had lots of the masses who felt like they didn't fit into any of those four official groups because all of them were too extreme in some regard. And so this was a world that was filled with division. It was a world that was filled with poverty and disease. It was a world that was filled with the oppression of women and children. And it was a world that was filled with racial tension. The, the racial tension between the Jews and the Samaritans was at an all-time high. But this is the world into which Jesus was born. This is the world into which Jesus showed up. And the night that Jesus was born, we're told by the gospel writers, by Luke in particular, that an angel appeared to some shepherds who were out in the field the night that Jesus was born. And does anybody remember what the angel said to the shepherds? The angel said, I bring you what? Yeah, I bring you good news. You know the, the birth story. In fact, this is what Luke tells us the angel said. The angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all People. Now, there are three components to that statement by the angel that I think are so important. Number one, the angel said, do not be afraid. Number two, I bring you good news of great joy. And number three, that will be for all people. Now, one of the great things about the Christian faith is that we have four different documents, four different individuals in the first century documented the, the ministry of Jesus. They documented what he said, what he taught, how he interacted with people, how he treated them, the things that he did. They, they tell us all about the ministry of Jesus from an eyewitness perspective. We don't have one of those documents. We have four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And all four of those documents that they recorded documenting the, the ministry of Jesus are now referred to as the four gospels that are the beginning of our New Testaments in the Bible. Well, did you know that the word gospel literally means good news? And so we have at the start of the New Testament four different good news documents that tell us all about the ministry of Jesus. And as you read through any of the four good news documents, we read what happened when Jesus showed up in the lives of an individual. When Jesus showed up in the lives of someone who was sick, they found healing. When Jesus showed up in the lives of somebody who had questions, they found answers. When Jesus showed up in the lives of somebody who was poor and, and needed something, they found compassion and care and provision. And when Jesus showed up in the lives of somebody who felt separated from God because of the things that they had done or said over the course of their life, they found forgiveness, and a fresh start. Anytime somebody had an interaction with Jesus, anytime Jesus showed up in the life of an individual, Jesus always met people exactly where they were, and Jesus always brought with him love and grace and compassion and joy. But, maybe you would say, but, John, hold on a second. Because what you're talking about are how when Jesus showed up in the lives of individuals, it was really good. And of course, it was really good for them. Of course, it was good for the individual standing in front of a literal Jesus standing there in the flesh. But didn't the angel say that, that we didn't need to be afraid, that we, there was good news for us, for all people? Yeah. So how does Jesus showing up 2,000 years ago become we don't need to be afraid today because there's good news for us and, and, and it applies to all of us. That's the important question. That's what I want us to think about together this morning as we celebrate Easter 2024. The reality is that all of our lives are unique. You are one of a kind. There's no one else exactly like you 
And your life is one of a kind. There is no one else who will live a life exactly like your life. But one of the things that's true is that there are some commonalities that are true for all of us. And one of the things that I think we can all acknowledge is true for us as an individual is that we are not perfect. I think we can all understand that we, we make mistakes, that as you think back over the course of your life, there have been times when you have said things or done some things that you know are less than perfect. You would recognize that, that you have not lived an absolutely perfect life, and we all have that in common. In fact, one of the very first followers of Jesus was a man named Paul, and in the first century, Paul wrote a letter to a group of Roman citizens. We call the letter that he wrote to them simply the Book of Romans, but it was just a letter he wrote to a group of Roman citizens. And in, in his letter to the Romans, this is what he says about this very fact, that we're all on the same page with this. In Romans 3.23, he says, there is no difference, like we're all on the same page here, he said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which I think we can all understand. We can all agree with that. Like, yeah, like if there's a God and he's holy and perfect, then like we've all fallen short of him. Now, the word that we don't love in, in Romans there is the word that, that, that we read that says that we have all sinned because this is a bit of a heavy word. It seems like the word sin is like not only a religious word, but it's a word that that carries some weight, it's kind of oppressive. Maybe, depending on your church background and your church experience, maybe you've experienced people in churches that have used that word to, to beat people up in an unhealthy way. And if that's the case, I'm so sorry for that. Because the word is actually much more simple than that. It's a very, it's a very straightforward word. The word sin is not a loaded word. What happened was, those original good news texts that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote, they wrote them in the common language that they spoke, which was the language of Greek. Well, when Bible scholars and translators came along and wanted to translate those Greek passages, those Greek good news documents, into English so that people like you and me could read them for ourselves in English, they had to think of an English word that meant what they had written in Greek. And so when they got to this idea that we've all done some things that fall short of gl the glory of God, they were like, what word do we have in English, in Old English, that means to miss the mark? And so they, they pulled this word sin out of the archery world. It, literally, they tapped into the sports world, the athletic world. Because at that time, what happened was, Back in the day, they would, they would engage in the sport of archery, where they would stand behind a line, and the archer would draw back their bow, and their, they would let their arrow fly, and then down at the other end of the archery lane, like 50 yards away, there'd be a target with a bullseye, and a judge would stand down next to the target, and the judge would watch where the arrow hits the, the target, and if they hit anything less than the mark of perfection, they would yell back to the archer, sin. And the archer would know, I wasn't perfect. And so the word sin literally just means to miss the mark of perfection or to miss the mark. You have to imagine, out of those two people in the sport of archery, I would much rather be the archer, right? I'd want to be the one sending the arrow, not the one down there standing by the target waiting to see where it hits, right? I found a picture that I thought illustrated what this must have been like. And I'm like, that's probably what it was like. You're like, no sin, no sin, no sin. Hit the middle of the, the target, right? So the word sin is simply a reflection of the fact that we all fail to live up to a morally perfect standard. Of course we do. Like, I think we can all agree with that. It gets a little bit more ten like tentative. We get a little bit more tentative, though, when it comes to accepting and sitting in the consequences that come along with sin. Nobody really likes to think about the impact of our sin. Again, in that letter to the Roman citizens, Paul writes in Romans chapter six, he puts it so bluntly when he says this, he writes simply, the wages of sin is what? Is death. He says the wages of sin is death. He pointed out what you and I have experienced in our own life is that sin kills things, that sin naturally kills things. 
You can take a healthy relationship. You have a relationship of any kind that's super healthy. But you bring enough sin into a relationship, and I don't care how healthy that relationship is, enough sin will kill even the healthiest of relationships. Sin can kill a career. You can have a job that you love, that you're successful at, you're climbing the ladder, you're, you're making all the moves, but you bring enough sin into your vocation and into your workplace, and sin can literally kill your job. It can kill a career. Sin kills things, even our own spirits. You do enough things that violate the standard that you feel in your heart, and you are left with this feeling of guilt and shame that burdens you down and weighs you down and has the potential to leave you with isolation and depression and just this feeling of, of, of loss. And when it comes to any hope of living our life in the presence of a good and holy and perfect God, living with the joy that comes from walking through life with the God of the universe, sin kills any hope of that because sin separates us from a holy, perfect God who is sinless, and it leaves us with this chasm between us and God that has to be bridged somehow. We all share this in common. We share this in common with every single person who has ever lived. So from the very beginning of time, people have tried to bridge that chasm that exists between us and God because of the sin and the death that our sin brings. So for the nation of Israel, they had what they called the sacrificial system. They would sacrifice as perfect of an animal as they could, and the idea was that that animal would absorb the death that their sin brought, and the blood shed by the perfect sacrifice would cover the gap between them and God, their sins would be forgiven, and they could experience life to the full with their heavenly Father. Thankfully, we live in a world where we no longer have the sacrificial system, but we have systems of our own to deal with the chasm between us and God, and I think the very best illustration of the, of the system that most people are relying on in our culture today would be one of these. You guys have seen these things before. They're called the scales of justice. I think that this this represents the system that most people rely on today to pay the penalty for their sins and to bridge the gap between them and God. It's the idea that these scales, like you put some weight on one side and it tips that way, but then if you put an equal amount of weight on the other side, it tips back level and everything is in balance, right? Well, in some ways, I think what we do is we pile our sins onto one side of the scale. And you think about your life and you go, Okay, yeah, if I'm just being honest with myself, there's probably some sin on one side of the scale for me. There's, you know, the times that I've lost my temper and, you know, a handful of times I remember just going absolutely ballistic. And I remember how I felt afterwards and I was kind of embarrassed and I was like, where did that come from? But that was deep inside me somewhere, but that was probably a sinful reaction and I probably you know, sin there. It probably wasn't perfect of me. And you think about, you know, well, there was some stuff that I've done at work where I've cut some corners and, you know, I made a couple decisions that, that uh, I guess were less than ethical and, you know, nobody found out. It didn't, it didn't really have made much of an impact, but, but yeah, I guess I know in my heart that it was kind of shady and so that would go in the sin side of the scale and, you go, I've done some stuff with the guys. You know, I've had some weekends, right? Like we, you know, joke that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but the reality is I guess it doesn't really stay in Vegas, and so that would go in here. And then we have to add onto that side of the scale all of the things that we think and feel that reflect less than perfection. The, the times that we feel rage well up within us towards someone or something. The, the, the jealousy that we feel when somebody else is getting what we feel like we deserve or what we want in our own life and we envy them and we want their life for our lives, but, but, but we're, we don't. We, we, we don't have it, but we want it. 
So all of these things get piled up on the sin side of the scale, but we try to offset it with the good that we do. And the reality is the majority of the time we're really good. Most of the time we're not running around sinning. We're just good people, right? And so on this side of the scale, we, we get to put the things like, you know, we've, we've donated to good causes and, and to charities and to church sometimes. So the money will go, well, that we give away goes on this side. And, and we served with that nonprofit with the organization one time. So that's got to go on this side. And, and all the other good stuff that we've done, you know, we, 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 we got our dog from the rescue instead of going straight to a breeder. And people know that's good. Like, we love to celebrate the fact that we got our dog from the rescue. You, oh, you went to a breeder? I went to the rescue. We got our dog at the rescue. So that's good, right? That goes on this side of the scale. And we hope that, that somehow at the end of our life, we don't like to think about this, but we hope that when we get to the end of our life and we stand before God himself, we hope that the scales are gonna be in balance or they're gonna tip in the direction that says the good outweighed the bad. And we hope based on the good that we've done, he's gonna be like, come on in, like spend eternity in paradise. But there are some problems with this system. The first problem with this system is that we never know which way the scales are leaning at, at no point in time do we ever get a window or an, or an insight into the scale to know which way it's tipping. And so we, we're always left in, in confusion. We're always left in this state of ambiguity, not sure which way the scales would tip if today was the day that we met our maker. And, and, and how much good does it take to offset sin? Like, like does one financial donation equal or offset like three little white lies? Is it more than that? Does it cover 10 white lies? Like, we don't know because it's not a clear system. We just have to live our lives in a state of wonder. The other problem with this system is we have to answer the question, does anybody really think that we can offset the sin that brings death with the good that we've done? Do we really believe that that we can earn our way to a holy, perfect, glorious God by making some good decisions, by giving some money or serving at the place or making the right call. I don't think so. I think if we're honest with ourselves, I think we'd all recognize, I don't think I'm, I can do enough to earn my way into heaven to where God goes, hey, man, you have punched your own ticket. Come on in because you have piled up so much good. It overwhelms all the sin you've ever committed and then some, you, you, you earned your way here. No. But the good news of Easter is that we don't have to, amen? The good news of Easter is that there is no scale, that Jesus didn't just come to offset the scale with good. Jesus came to say, you don't need the scale at all. Put the scale away. The scale is not part of the equation. And so Jesus, yeah. So Jesus came and he lived a perfect, sin-free life. And then he went to the cross, and he willingly laid down his life to be the perfect atonement for sin once and for all on behalf of anybody who would believe in him. This is what Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians about what God has done. He says in Ephesians 1, God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Come on, we don't need no scales because Jesus purchased our freedom with his blood. Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus was buried. They laid him to rest in the tomb and they rolled the stone across the entrance and they walked away. But that was Friday, and the story doesn't end on Friday. Matthew, in his good news text, tells us that two days later, this is Matthew 28, 1 through 7, Matthew tells us early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. 
For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a deep faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. Now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Jesus showed up. God raised him back to life from the dead. Jesus not only paid the penalty for our sin, but in being raised back to life, he also defeated death all in one fell swoop. And check this out. Earlier, I said when Jesus showed up in the flesh for the very first time, the angel told the shepherds out in the field, number one, do not be afraid. How cool is it that now, after Jesus' death, after his departure, after he is raised back to life, the very first thing that is said after Jesus shows up again by both the angel and Jesus is don't be afraid. Apparently, as followers of Jesus, we do not need to be afraid today. Just the other day, I was driving somewhere with my daughter. She's Braylon, 12 years old. And uh, from the back seat, Braylon said to me, she said, hey, Dad, did you know that in the Bible there are 365 different times when God tells us we do not need to be afraid? She said there's one for every single day of the year, which is God's way of letting us know there will never be a day that you should be afraid. And I thought, are you kidding me? Who are you, little girl? Like, <laughs> my daughter is so perfect. My boys, not so much. But my daughter is perfect. And I was like, what a fantastic stat. And I was like, I'm probably going to use that, but I need to look it up to confirm it's true before I go, you know, spouting that off in public. So I looked it up, and apparently it's true that in the original manuscripts, in the Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic texts, there's about 365 times that God tells us through the writers of Scripture that we do not need to be afraid. This is part of the good news for us today is that we are invited to live without fear no matter what we are facing, just like those earliest followers of Jesus lived. The earliest followers of Jesus spent six weeks with him after his resurrection. Jesus spent six weeks eating and drinking with them, answering their questions, explaining things that didn't make sense prior to the resurrection but made sense after the resurrection, and giving them their instructions going forward. And then we're told that at the end of that six-week period, Jesus literally ascended into heaven before their very eyes. And then the followers of Jesus, without fear, spread out and started to take the good news message of Jesus into other parts of the known world. They took the gospel the good news to other people who needed to receive it. And in doing so, they literally changed the world. And I don't know where you're at in your life today. I don't know what it is that you carry on your shoulders into this place this Easter morning. But I know one of the things that we all have in common is the fact that nobody gets out of this lifetime without some scar tissue. There are always seasons of life that are filled with pain and confusion for every single one of us. And in a room with this many people in it, 
I know that that means that there's a whole bunch of you who are living in one of those seasons today, and you carry that on your shoulders in with you this morning. And if that's you, I simply want to say to you, the good news of Jesus wasn't just good news for the individuals that Jesus showed up in their life in the flesh 2,000 years ago. And it's not just good news for the masses at large in a generic sense. The good news is good news for you specifically today too. And that if you will invite Jesus into your life, if you will place your faith in him and say, Jesus, I want you to be the one who bridges the gap between me and my heavenly father. I don't want to try to do it myself. I want to accept the free gift of salvation and forgiveness that you offer, that you paid for. God, I want you to do it for me. I'm telling you, if you will pray that prayer, Jesus will show up because this is what he does. Jesus still shows up. He still heals, and he still forgives, and he still sets people free. He still offers life, and he still gives grace, and he still brings hope. He still bridges the gap. He still loves. He still conquers sin and death, and that's good news this morning, and that's the good news that we celebrate. And so this morning, no matter where you are in life, you need to know you do not need to be afraid because Jesus has come. He has conquered sin and death. He loves you, and he is offering you life. That's what happens when Jesus shows up. And that's why we celebrate, and that's why we sing. So the band is gonna lead us in a song that celebrates what happens when Jesus shows up this morning. Would you stand and respond and worship with us?
that's been working. Oh, I've got good news. Oh, Jesus loves you. No matter what you bring. Oh, he's in love with you. No matter your history. Oh, he's in celebration at all of our services this weekend we're getting to celebrate with people through the ceremony of baptism the idea is that each one of the individuals being baptized would say man I was dead in my sin but through Jesus I have been brought back to life and that's why baptism is such a beautiful ceremony such a beautiful sacrament and uh, what you're going to experience is that uh, we invited everybody who's being baptized to come in and to sit down in front of the camera and to share their story if they wanted to do so. And uh, so most people said yes, and they graciously agreed to come share their story with us. So you're going to experience somebody's story on the, on the screens. Then you'll see them in the pool with us where I'm going to ask them, the question is, are you, are you trusting Jesus to bridge the gap between you? Are you trusting Jesus and what he did in the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And based on their statement, yes, they are, we get to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, we get to join in with all of heaven in celebrating and rejoicing over them. So anytime we bring somebody up out of the water, I wanna hear you celebrating them and cheering them on as we join in with all of heaven. So check out the first story. Growing up, I, I knew God and I, you know, read Bible stories and went to a religious school and felt like, yeah, like God is a part of my life. But as I got older, I realized that the Jesus that I knew wasn't the authentic Jesus. I slowly met people in my life through my journey that shared with me without even saying like, oh, I'm a Christian, you should be a Christian. Just the way that they were just emanated who he was the joy that they had from having him in their life. In my college years, I went to a Christian university and I went to a prayer retreat. And that was the first time that I ever really felt like God was sitting right next to me. I'd always felt like, you know, he's just this guy in the book that I'm reading about and he's really far away and I'm not really sure I know who he is. In that prayer retreat, I felt all this turmoil inside me and anxiety, depression, and it all just kind of lifted off my shoulders. I have never experienced so much peace in my life. I thought, you know, if I can experience this, why wouldn't I build my life on it? Baptism is kind of looking at, you know, how I was living my life before. I'm a planner. I'm someone that wants to plan my own life down to every detail. I'm no longer interested in that. I'm not interested in living the life that I have planned. I'm interested in living the life that God has already planned for me. And so baptism is me stepping into that life fully. My name is Katherine Schwegel and I am changed. I grew up in a small town um, in Kenya um, where, I mean, Christianity is not really a big thing. You know, my parents passed away uh, when I was two years old and I kind of started getting a little bit of a, you know exposure to Christianity because this orphanage was a, a Christian-based orphanage. We'll be asked at church like, "Who do you guys believe?" And you you know we'll say like Jesus, but really in my heart or like in my mind, I didn't really know like what is you know Christ or who is this person that we um, believe in. And honestly, if I had to say if there's a time 
that I really kind of felt Christ even more is when I moved here. That's when I kind of started to pursue God. My senior year in high school, that's when kind of when I, I just kind of decided to put more work into it. I can't say that I started to like feel something. It's like that's when I kind of decided to like pursue more to like really work on my faith. I want to say my relationship with um, God right now, I'm at a safer place than where I was before because of like how much I've learned. And I think from the sermon that I heard from Dugan, I did a lot, I mean, I did a lot of like tracking where like I grew up, kind of self evaluate myself, like who do I really, you know, believe in? That kind of journey of like tracking myself, like looking back and like, you know, struggles that I went through in life and, and like where my life kind of went okay. And sometimes it never, you know, when okay, those are the things that I look back and I think that's where my faith kind of gets stronger. I feel like just based on that, that's where my growth comes from. The reason why I want to get baptized is because I want to put my faith out in public to people and show people that I am willing to, you know, follow Christ. And I want this to be the mark of my identification, not only my, you know, continue continuous journey of my life with Christ, but also to show people and encourage people that this is a, a good obedience to follow Christ. My name is Julius Ogari and I'm changed. Before I met Christ, my life was honestly really depressing. I struggled with mental health issues and I struggled with addiction. Addiction is part of my story. I would say I knew of God growing up. Um, we went to a Catholic church. The idea that I had about God was that he was a like an angry God. He only wanted me to do good and I wasn't good enough to meet up to his standard. I feel like I hit a rock bottom. The things that I was using to try to fill a God-sized hole weren't working anymore. I would turn to alcohol as a distraction, but it wasn't doing much for me anymore, you know? I still felt very alone. There was just one moment where I had gotten myself into some trouble because of my drinking. And in that moment of desperation, I, I turned to prayer, I turned to God, and I felt like he really helped me. Like he really stepped up and it was, it was something that was undeniable. Like I knew it was God. And I didn't feel like God didn't want me there. You know, I felt like he was there with me through the mess, through the chaos. Uh, I heard about a group that was meeting called Rooted here at Heartland. So I started attending and that really helped me out a lot because I didn't know where to start in the Bible. Now I read my Bible weekly. You know, I, I pick it up and I look forward to picking it up. It's just, it's amazing to see the growth because I don't feel alone anymore. You know, I always feel like he's right there with me. Baptism is important to me because I was baptized Catholic, but I consider myself Christian. So I wanna be baptized Christian. I don't know exactly why, but it just feels right. My name is Yasmin Garcia Zalapa and I am changed. I grew up in West Virginia. I was a Lutheran for the majority of my time while I was there, so up until about 18 years old. I hung around the wrong people. Um, I kind of grew up kind of some issues with like domestic uh, violence. And I was not a follower of Christ for probably a good 20 years. It wasn't until about this past summer, I was at one of my lowest points in my life. Um, I was contemplating, you know, ending my life. And there was one day in particular where at that moment, I I heard a voice in my head that I had never heard in my entire life. And I knew it wasn't my voice because I know what I sound like in my head. I know what my subconscious sounds like. This was distinct and it was right in the middle of really hysterical crying. And I said, God, I know I haven't talked to you in forever, but I am like to my wits end. And then all of a sudden, like, it's like somebody turned off a faucet. 
and like my tears completely stopped and I never ever experienced that in my life. I just sat out loud. I was like, is that you? Did you really come to me when I felt like I didn't even deserve it? That happened. And then all of a sudden I started seeing the chosen like videos pop through. And I was like, look at this awesome show. And it's like, they really bring Jesus into this whole other realm that I've never seen him before. I actually went to Maker's Market last December when you guys had that here. And I was walking around, I hadn't had a church yet. So I was like, this place is really cool. I like it here. I know this is the craft fair and this has nothing to do with what's going on, but you know what? I'm gonna come visit this church. In January is when I actually came in person and I've been coming ever, every Sunday. It's part of my week, you know? It's what renews me for the rest of the week. The reason I wanna get baptized is I just wanna be renewed. I wanna get rid of what I was in the past, what I'd done in the past, and I want to be a new person. My name is Tracy Davis and I am changed. I was always part of Christ's family. I always felt that Christ was within me. I am a retired teacher. I taught for 27 years. The hardest job I had was I taught for four years on the north side of Milwaukee in the very highest crime rate neighborhood in Wisconsin. I learned just as much from my students as they learned from me. And I could not have done that job if Jesus wasn't walking beside me. I moved to uh, Madison to be closer to my two youngest grandsons. And my daughter loved Heartland Church. She just said, you have to, you have to just experience this with me. So I went with her and I've been coming every Sunday since then. I've even influenced other people to join the church. My boyfriend attends church with me every Sunday, and he said he hadn't been to any church in 20 years. I like the fact that they're welcoming to everyone, no matter what their faith background was or is, everyone is welcome. I'm here to be baptized because I want a closer connection with Jesus. I want to continue to have a positive impact on other people's lives, and I can't do that without Jesus. And that's why I want to be baptized again as an adult, because I need Jesus to help me. My name is Renee Schrammel, and I have changed. My life before I met Christ was a mess. Struggled with a lot of um, childhood stuff. Didn't know how to deal with it. Started drinking pretty young. Had a tragic death of a, of a loved one. The addiction was how I got through it instead of turning to God. And it just, it never stopped. I was a garbage man for a while and who's now probably one of my closest friends. I met at work one day. They threw him in my truck with me because I wasn't feeling good and he needed to learn the route. So he just rode with me and 10, 15 minutes, we knew our whole life stories. Turns out he does like a little, they call it a Bible study through his, some close friends and his family at his house. He was just like, you know, why don't you give it a shot? Part of my, my addiction and my battles and my struggles, you know, my marriage was done and my wife's actually the one that, when we started trying to figure this out again, found you guys through YouTube and we were watching it at home and every Sunday and we finally, I was just like, I wanna go. Like, let's just go. And we've been coming every Sunday. When I started going to the Bible group, they were gonna do baptisms and I was still struggling with my own stuff. I didn't go. And it's just been on my heart, you know, I was, asking the guys at Bible study, like, hey, are we gonna do this again? Cause like, I feel like I missed it. And then you guys announced that you were gonna do them on Easter Sunday. So a conversation I had with my wife a couple days before that. And I was like, well, that answers that, I'm signing up. My name is Joey Solon and I am changed.
I grew up with two loving parents that had negative experiences in the church. So I did not grow up with any sort of religious affiliation. My childhood had a lot of fear and anxiety from a super young age to the point when I was 12 ish i had panic attacks that were so debilitating i wasn't able to go to school it was in 2019 when i heard a story about a little girl i was actually home with my parents for dinner and they had told us about a family friend and they knew this family that had a little girl in a accident she was in critical condition and they wanted prayers for her i remember thinking i want to pray for that girl but my family didn't pray we didn't pray at the dinner table, that would have been weird. As I was back on campus, I was pursuing pediatrics. So I spent a lot of time at the children's hospital on clinical rotations. Again, this same family and the same girl came up. Medically, things were so complicated, but there was so much healing still happening. Eventually, I was on social media. I I saw the little girl's name on people's hands and family was asking for prayers. For whatever reason, I felt like a deep urge to pray for this girl and I asked God for breath in her lungs, to bless the hands of her doctors, to be there with her family in the hospital. Then I found Heartland on social media and I found their website and I listened to services online and I spent time just in the Bible myself. I spent more time talking to God and I've been serving in 608 since the fall. My anxiety before I knew God came from confusion over my worth. And then after I encountered God for the first time and then started to learn more, I learned that I am worthy just because I'm made in his image and that I've learned in the word that I am a new creation, I am not to be frightened or dismayed, that I am forgiven, that I am complete, that nothing can separate me from God's love. I've been thinking about getting baptized for probably at least a year, holding on to stress and fear is almost like protection in some way and really just setting it down at the feet of Jesus, really just surrendering it is vulnerable. And then the other part is kind of like you have to get in front of people, you have to be dunked and that changed recently. That little girl from the story, Ava Love, came into 608 this winter. This girl that I've prayed for over the past five years and the girl who introduced me to God. When I saw her, I knew that it was time. If she fights big battles regularly and is still spreading the good news to more people and farther places than a lot of us will in our lifetime, then I can get a little wet if it's gonna glorify God. My name is Maddie Oy and I'm changed.
I can't think of a better way to celebrate Easter and all that it means that we are given life, that we are given freedom, that we are given hope than by celebrating the testimony of people who that is so deeply true of. We are gonna end today. I know we're going a little late, but we, I think, believe we have a reason to praise. So if you would stand up with us as we sing this last song. Psalm 66 says, shout joyful praises to God all the earth. Tell the world how glorious he is. Come and see what our God has done, what awesome miracles he performs for his people. That's so true, church. So let's sing this last song out together.
Oh, man. All right. Well, hey, before you go, I got to invite you back next week. Next Sunday, we're going to kick off a new series called Family Feud that we are going to have so much fun with. Uh, come. It's going to be very practical. It's going to be a blessing. And uh, with that said, thanks for being here. Have a great Easter, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday.